coconut oil. I know they say it's the best thing, but it's still a saturated fat. And also all of your organ meats and any of your animal proteins have saturated fat in it. Some are higher than others. So there's a great concern. Also, if you're choosing a diet that's higher in fat, your body may not be able to, to push that all the way through your system. You know, bile helps absorb fat. It puts it where it needs to go. If you don't have as much bile moving through your body like it should, sometimes it does come out <sighs> through you in an uncomfortable way. So choosing a diet that's really high in saturated fat may actually cause you to, to run to the bathroom a little bit more. Um, it can be also a little bit harder to eat paleo because you're not relying on the canned foods and the processed food. You know, not that I have a problem with that as a dietitian. I think that's great, but you know, it might be harder to make your own tomato sauce, you know, especially if you are tired. I have a hard time making dinner myself sometimes. So if you do have more fatigue, eating, following a strict paleo diet may be a contraindicated. And as we all know, and unfor it's unfortunate, eating healthy can be more expensive. So um, <laughs> I, I checked out a paleo cookbook just to see what all was in it, and just for a week, um, the ingredients, it was this long. So um, it may, you know, and, but it may be an investment in good health too, so I, I hear that as well. Um, What's really interesting is that there's a clinical trial that just concluded about um, a high-protein, high-fiber diet in patients with, and I, I put cirrhosis because that's what was on the study, um, but it was, it was someone in Mexico, and he um, had two arms to the study, and he had non-cirrhotic and cirrhotic, and he had both of them follow a high-protein, high-fiber diet. Each arm had nutritional counseling once a month for six months. Um, what they did, the primary outcome was to measure nutritional status. So they're looking at body weight and height to measure body mass index, tricep skin fold thickness and mid-arm circumference to assess lean body mass. And then they also are measuring fat mass, fat-free mass, intracellular and extracellular body water. Um, and then the secondary outcome was minimal hepatic encephalopathy and quality of life. So the study started in September 2011 and concluded in Feb February 2016, um, they only accrued 36 patients, um, and the final data collection date was 2015. And I wrote the guy to ask him if he would share what he's found, and he never got back to me, so we're still waiting. <laughs> um, but he did go up and update his study, so I know he got my email, So because I saw like the day after I sent it that he went up and updated it on clinical trials that the study was closed. So hopefully he'll have something and he'll post it. Um, clinicaltrials.gov is the website. So if you want to check it out periodically. So I think, I think it'll be real fascinating. And it's, I think it's exciting to see that people are looking at what all we can do. Um, so the question is, you know, does the paleo diet make us sleep better, help us lose weight, provide, you know, a lot of people who do CrossFit do the paleo diet. Um, does it burn off stored fat, you know, by eating lean meats and avoiding dairy and avoiding grains? I don't know. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of holes in the paleo diet. Um, they have found that the people in the paleo era did eat grains. So that kind of shoots that one in the dark. But um, I think by taking certain parts of the paleo diet, you know, by increasing your fruit and vegetable intake, that increases those good phytochemicals and anti antioxidants. Antioxidants which bind with these little free radicals running around in your body and may keep them from causing harm. You do watch your intake of processed foods with this diet. So you're watching the sausage and all of the real salty meats. You are cutting your intake of sugar and salt. Um, our rec the recommendation for sugar now is only 10% of your calories should come from sugar. So for women, that's two teaspoons of, of, of sugar. And for men, because they just metabolize so much faster, <laughs> nine teaspoons. Um, and then watching your intake of sodium. So less than 2,300 milligrams per day of sodium is what's recommended. And if you've ever followed a low sodium diet, you know that this eliminates a lot of the junk, a lot of the processed foods. So why I don't think that a paleo diet is sustainable or it's maybe beneficial, I think that there's a lot of really good, strong proponents to that that may be helpful. Um, the nightshades is something that goes along with the paleo diet. There's a lot of uh, connections if, if you 
go to Google like I do. So the question is, what are nightshades? They're uh, from the Solanacea family. They're um, poisonous and non-poisonous. Belladonna, if y'all know that, that's kind of popular as a nightshade, or not popular. <laughs> um, but the whole thing is that these nightshade plants have parts of the plant that are, um, they use it as like protection from themselves. Like maybe their leaves or the stem are bitter or maybe poisonous to help protect the plant. Um, they contain compounds called solanine and glycoalkaloids. So what's included in the nightshade plants? Um, a lot of stuff from my garden. <laughs> Tomatoes, white potatoes, eggplant, okra, peppers, goji berries, tomatillos, sorrel, gooseberries, ground cherries, which are, are different, um, pepino melons, tobacco, paprika, cayenne pepper, and capsicum. So why does Tom Brady do it? If y'all don't know who Tom Brady, well, you should know who he is, but he does not eat nightshades, which I thought was really interesting. And the recommendation is that it, um, if you eliminate nightshades from your diet, you have higher energy levels, it reduces GI discomfort, um, reduces chronic pain, tenderness, aches, muscle spasms, um, may reduce inflammation, uh, can improve mobility and joint flexibility, can affect your mood, um, and if you have skin rashes, they disappear. <laughs> so the recommendation is that you eliminate all of these foods from your diet for three months, and then you add them back one at a time and see if you're sensitive to these foods. Um, it's also recommended that you consume these vegetables at optimal ripeness. How many of y'all know that you're not supposed to eat a green potato? Have y'all heard that? Oh, that's a green potato. So yeah, because it's bad. <laughs> Well, what that is is solanine, um, and that's toxic or poisonous. So if you ever see a green potato, so that goes for all of those vegetables that were listed in the nightshade plant, uh, family, but you want to consume them at the peak of freshness or when it ripens, so you have the least amount of solanine in it, which I thought was interesting. Um, so does this, does this benefit us? Um, I don't know. There's studies out there that actually show that some of these nightshade vegetables are actually uh, can help with inflammation. There's a study um, with arthritis that had purple potatoes and yellow potatoes and found that those who consume those actually had decreased markers of inflammation. Um, and then also they have great source, they're also a great source of vitamin C, which actually may help decrease inflammation as well. However, everyone is different, and everyone is special, and we're all made up so differently, and there's foods that we all avoid because they don't make us feel good. So if you think that's something that you want to try, you know, it, it, may, it may help. You know, and there's a lot of people on the internet who find that it's helpful. So um, if that's something you wanted to try, I don't think that that would be harmful. So then we move on to the anti-inflammatory diet. So we'll be talking about what is it, how can it affect PVC, and is it, is, if it's safe. Um, so we talked, a, uh, several people have talked a little bit about inflammation, but it's basically a complex form of communication that occurs within the body to help repair damaged cells. And there's two different kinds of inflammation. There is acute and then there's chronic. Um, the acute phase is when the body uses complex signaling to communicate a need for repair or removal of a foreign invader. I think a great example of this is appendicitis. It happens, they cut it out, you get some medication, you feel better. The end. Um, chronic is a little bit different. That's when the communication patterns are flawed, the body's unable to effectively repair those cells, and sometimes it ends up attacking itself. So chronic is something that just continues. Um, so the research on diet inflammation has suggested that some foods may help decrease inflammation. You know, we talked about the potatoes. Um, and some foods may actually increase inflammation. So I stole this from Andrew Weil, uh, but I thought it was kind of nice. And it, I don't think there's actually one specific anti-inflammatory diet, but this just kind of gives you an idea of what's recommended. Um, you notice that you know, the vegetables and the whole grains and the fruits are at the bottom, and that's what you want to make most of your diet. Um, greener herbal tea, healthy fats and oils, and then protein, um, a little bit higher. And you see that the protein sources are mainly from fish, from vegetarian sources of protein, nuts, seeds, beans, legumes. Um, and then he likes the supplements, and then healthy treats at the very top, which would have been like 
you know, peach cobbler every now and then. <laughs> So to go a little bit more in depth to it, the anti-inflammatory diet does recommend grains, and specifically the whole grains. Whole grains are not as refined as maybe, say, white bread. Um, whole grains still cont uh, contain the natural bran, the natural vitamin E, which is a natural antioxidant, which may help decrease inflammation. It also includes, uh, includes beans and brown rice. Um, Anti-inflammatory diet uh, supports intake of omega-3. We all know the salmon, which is good omega-3. Wild salmon is a better source because it eats all the other wild fish and it increases the intake of omega-3. Flax seeds and chia seeds and walnuts um, don't contain omega-3. They actually contain a component called ALA, and I'm not going to tell you what it stands for, but it, it acts similar um, to omega-3 in the body. It may down-regulate cytokines, which are causing inflammation. Foods rich in antioxidants, such as all those wonderful fruits and vegetables, which have a lot of color in it. So your, your peppers, your tomatoes, um, yellow, orange, purple, red, dark green, citrus, all of those are um, foods that are incorporated in the anti-inflammatory diet. Ginger, tea, I've seen a lot of research on black tea um, and green tea. Um, turmeric, and then olive oil. The foods that actually can increase inflammation are the ones that are high in saturated and trans fats. So we talked about the, the, the fats that are solid at room temperature and the um, animal proteins. Also foods high in sugar and simple carbohydrates. You know, those are okay in moderation, but when we consume a lot of these foods, we can actually um, consume more than we need, which can lead to weight gain, which may also support inflammation. So research is increasing on chronic inflammation, autoimmune diseases. Um, diets rich in these foods have been shown beneficial in patients with arthritis and lupus. I didn't find anything specific to PBC, but I think that it can be easily translated. It complies with recommendations from the American Institute of Cancer Research, which is for cancer prevention and for cancer survivorship, uh, the American Diabetic Association, the American Heart Association. It doesn't exclude any major food group um, or increase the risk of developing efficiency. So it gets a little green TSA check. Um, so thinking about the paleo diet, the nightshade plants, um, the anti-inflammatory diet, you know, overall, nutrition should provide adequate calories and protein to maintain a healthy weight and hold on to your lean body mass. Unfortunately, after we turn 20, we start to lose lean body mass. So that's where activity is important and also making sure you're getting adequate protein. Um, and then knowing that sometimes you do have to change your diet um, regardless, you know, depending on what's going on. If you're having trouble absorbing fat or tolerating fat, you may want to decrease your intake of fat. If you're um, maybe retaining some fluid, definitely watching your sodium intake. The main thing is, um, above everything, I think, you know, thinking about the paleo diet and the anti-inflammatory diet, this is more of a way to eat. You want to try and fill half of your plate with fruits and vegetables, a quarter of your plate with whole grains, and a quarter of your plate with healthy protein. Uh, the American Institute of Cancer Research calls this the new American plate. Previously, um, where the vegetables and the fruits were would be all protein, and then when, where the whole grains would, would be like rice, and then when the healthy protein would be like mashed potatoes. So we want to shift how we look, or maybe there was corn, um, but we want to shift how we fill our plate. Um, the more vegetables and fruit, the more fiber you have, the more natural uh, can, um, antioxidants and phytochemicals. Um, choosing healthy proteins, that's lean meats, that's fish, that's chicken, that's turkey, that's the vegetarian sources of protein. Soy is also included in that. I think red meat's okay, but I think it's good to consume that in moderation, and usually no more than 18 ounces a week. So that's about three servings of a really good burger every week. Um, and then choosing the whole grains, which would be whole wheat, brown rice, whole wheat pasta, and watching those refined uh, grains that don't really provide us um, any benefit. I really believe we are what we eat. And if we're eating the things that are working for us, they're going to help our body work better. Um, special considerations may, as I said, may vary depending on um, the severity of the disease. Um, 
things that we uh, talked about, the vitamins A, D, E, and K, and those are fat-soluble vitamins. So if you're having trouble digesting fat, you're gonna have trouble digesting these specific vitamins. So it's important, as it was discussed, to monitor these deficiencies yearly. And then um, we had a really good uh, conversation about bone health, so I don't know if I need to beat that one again, but <laughs> um, of course there's decreased production and absorption of vitamin D that increases the risk for osteoporosis and osteopenia. So what are the recommendations? For vitamin A, if you are deficient, um, you know, a normal recommendation is 2,300 to 3,000 international units. Vitamin A is something that you have to be really careful with because it is a fat-soluble vitamin. It is stored. So if you're not deficient, it's not something you want to go out and eat a lot of it because it actually can lead to toxicity. So you really do want to watch um, your supplementation. If you are deficient, then it's recommended um, 5,000 to 15,000. I've seen uh, articles that err more on the side of caution, 5,000. The tolerable upper limit for vitamin A is 10,000 international units a day. Uh, most multivitamins have about 5,000, so just to give you an idea. And then food sources are sweet potatoes, green leafies, carrots, egg yolk, um, butter, and liver is a really good source of vitamin A, unfortunately. <laughs> um, vitamin E and vitamin K, uh, from the research it shows that these are not, um, most people don't have these deficiencies. Um, vitamin E, the, rec the recommendation is 22.4 international units. If you're taking a multivitamin, it's going to be about 35. Um, and if you're eating any kind of fat, um, eggs, oil, if you have any salad dressing on your salad, you're probably getting enough. And then vitamin K, it's a great, a great source is dark green leafies. But those are things that you would want to be tested specifically before you really start going out and supplementing. And then vitamin D. Um, as was discussed, the daily recommendation is 800 to 1,000 international units. Um, and then if you are deficient, 50,000 units for 10 to 12 weeks and then having that level retested. Um, the dairy products are really the best source of this and they do absorb better than supplementation. Um, but like it was mentioned, it's important to see how much you're actually getting and then supplement what you need. Um, and then calcium, the 1,000, 1,200 milligrams. That's what I was talking about, okay. Thinking about the paleo diet, it takes a lot of broccoli to get your calcium intake, you know, so if that's something that you are consuming, then you may wanna fill, you may wanna supplement. Um, but vitamin D and calcium is something that is important to be mindful of. So, so the takeaway, I think, when you think of everything is watch the junk. Watch your sodium, watch your sugar, watch your red meat and, and your potato chips. Um, eat more fruits and vegetables. You know, if that's something that you're thinking, oh, I don't think I'm going to do, or you know, even where do I start? Sometimes it's helpful just to say, I'm going to have one more serving of fruit and vegetables every day. Instead of when I go home and snacking on chips and salsa, I'll have, you know, an apple and some low-fat cheese or something like that. As far as the nightshade plants, I don't think that the research really supports it, but I think if that's something that you think that you may be sensitive to, then it, it could be worth trying to see if that benefits you. Um, the anti-inflammatory diet, I think, is probably has the most research that supports um, maybe it would be beneficial. And then, of course, supplement if you need to. Um, Michael Pollan's not my favorite, but I do like this quote. Um, Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So, and I'd like to thank my colleague, Stephanie Moore, who helped me with this presentation. And thank you very much for having me here. previously told to avoid organ foods and also lobster, your opinion. I guess it's the reason of why you were told. You know, when I think about um, organ foods, I, I don't really think that they're really beneficial. Um, I have to say that I have, do have some patients. You know, I work with cancer patients. Sometimes they have low um, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and if we're thinking about really high iron foods and I can't think of anything else, I may throw that organ meat out there every now and then. Um, but I think it's a really high source of saturated fat, and I don't really think it's something to include. Um, 
Lobster. <sighs> That's such a nice food. Um, <laughs> I guess it depends on the reason. Um, it is a higher cholesterol food, so you know that wouldn't be something. Hmm? Is it the iodine? Okay, and there's. Okay. Um, then if you're watching your iodine intake. You know, it, it is a, all of the, the shellfish. And also there's some uh, concerns about, um, I guess I'm thinking about walking on the beach barefoot, but um, with the Vibrio. Um, I guess I would have to know what context. So I can't really answer that. Don't do it. No. <laughs> Well, we did talk about liver, and liver is a really great source of vitamin A, but it's also a really good source of saturated fat. So I think if you're wanting to supplement with vitamin A, I would probably find another source. You know, sweet potatoes, awesome, good fiber, good vitamin A, not so high in fat. Um, what is your take on clean-sourced anti-inflammatory and immune-boosting supplements or homeopathics? Mm. I think it would depend on what's in the supplement. You know, you always have to be concerned about supplements when you take them because they're not regulated by the FDA. They're regulated by a different office in the government and they're um, kind of, unless they kill somebody, then they won't pull it off the market. So, <laughs> to be frank, um, so when you're choosing supplements, there's uh, something on them called a USP and it's like a little circle and it means that it's the United Society of Pharmacopoeia and that's one of the governing bodies that says, hey, this is actually what's in here, it says it's what, what's in here. There's really no labeling laws, and it's my experience that a lot of these supplements actually have other um, things in them, like lead, bacteria, um, other things that may harm you. You know, it depends on what the supplement is. I would have to look at it. I'd have to look at the ingredients and see what's in it, but I don't know if there's anything um, out there that may benefit you as far as a pill or a potion or a powder, but there's some interesting stuff out there that may do no harm. So it really just depends on what the supplement is and what else is going on. Okay. What are your thoughts on turmeric supplements with PVC? Um, depends on the source of the turmeric. I think it's okay to use turmeric as a spice, but I haven't really seen anything that supports. I know Dr. Oz loves turmeric, um, but <laughs> I've seen some, um, turmeric uses the same pathway as a lot of other medications. So it would be, um, so if you're taking a pill of turmeric, um, it's possible it may interfere with your other medications and either make them work too well or not as well. So I think it's probably a better idea to use it as a spice. Um, I do have to say Dr. Oz has like this turmeric spice something on his website that you can make and put on potatoes and vegetables and things like that. And I think that if you did that, that would be probably a better way to get that rather than taking a pill. Didn't ancestors on a paleo diet avoid modern diseases because they died young? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Are pains cramping in feet due to a dietary deficiency? What can be done for cramps in the middle of the night? Oh, that's no fun, is it? Um, I don't know. It's possible, you know, they, what? Do you know? So try it and let us know. <laughs> So sometimes um, cramping can be due to low potassium. <laughs> um, it would probably take some um, investigating work. Sometimes you're dehydrated. There's lots of reasons why we get cramps. I don't know, honestly. Um, but if you want to try the teaspoon of dry mustard, see if it works. Hmm? Yellow mustard. Oh, like the little Heinz that you put on a hot dog? Okay, there you go. <laughs> okay, last, oh, there's more, is this it? Okay. Okay, how do you feel about diet sodas? Mmm. <laughs> so, I have to tell you, I really like my Coke Zero every now and then. 
But um, there's some really interesting information that says that when you consume diet sodas, it actually affects your, um, they talked about the, the, the biome or your uh, microbiome and actually decreases some of the beneficial bacteria. Um, you know, diet sodas, there's been a lot of research out coming out lately of, you know, what does it do? Does it actually help increase obesity? Does it increase weight loss? Because your body doesn't account for those amount of calories and just eats more. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's something that you should probably do all the time every day, you know, an eight pack of Diet Coke every day. I know there's lots of information out there about, you know, artificial sweeteners, if they make us feel bad or not. Um, I've done some research on Splenda and Equal and the pink stuff. And if you really dig a lot, a lot, their recommendation is no more than four servings of artificial sweeteners a day. So, so I kind of keep that as a rule of thumb. Um, if you're diabetic, then it's a question of, you know, do you want to consume the sugar or do, you, or do you want to have that diet beverage and watch your blood sugar? <sighs> diet sodas. I think they're kind of controversial. I think probably in moderation they're okay, but maybe water or tea might be a better choice. Because I'm thinking about, you know, you are what you eat, and if you drink Diet Coke all day long, maybe you are a Diet Coke, but if you drink tea, at least you're getting some good antioxidants and polyphenols, something that may help do something for you. So. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. The one thing that I would add to, don't leave. Okay is that I haven't seen a Pepsi since I left Western New York. The airports, the airlines, they all have Coke, and I can't wait to get home and have a Pepsi. <laughs> okay, Alicia, thank you very much. This is a small token of our appreciation for coming to speak thank with us today, much. and it was a wonderful speech. Thank you. All right, a little housekeeping before we let you go. A reminder to deposit your name tags and lanyards on the table as you leave and also your evaluation forms, although I see a lot of them are already back there, so thank you very much for that. I also want to thank you for all your support in our fundraising efforts, and I don't have an exact figure yet because I have been so busy, but I can tell you with a great smile that I did achieve my personal goal of raising $10,000. So. And I hope you enjoyed the conference. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you made some new friends. And I hope to see you all at a future conference or perhaps at the big party we'll throw when they, make, they finally find a cure for this thing and we're just going to celebrate and party instead of talk. Thank you for coming and have a safe trip home.